Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about a very important layer of the heart, and that is the myocardium. Now, just a brief review, we've got three major regions or layers of the heart. The inner part that makes direct contact with the blood moving through the chambers, like the ventricle and atria, that's of course the endocardium. And then this layer, which is really what we're going to talk about in this video, is the myocardium. And remember, myo is a prefix that means muscle. So this layer is going to be a very strong muscular layer. And then superficial to that, we of course have the pericardium, that's divided up further, but we'll talk about that in another video. Here we want to focus on the myocardium, and the myocardium is a layer of cardiac muscle. Okay. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. What do you think the energy demand is by the myocardium? That is energy like ATP. Well, the energy demand is going to be very high. Think about it. The myocardium, really the heart as a whole, but the myocardium is what pumps blood. That's what beats. You want to have your heart beat all the time. Your heart can't take a break, right? Um, if you go exercise, of course, the heart rate's going to increase, the force of contraction's going to increase, but even at rest, your heart has to always pump. So therefore, it's important to have a good blood supply to the heart all the time, and that's because it has such a high energy demand. Now, specifically in terms of the energy demand, the myocardium relies heavily on aerobic cellular respiration. And this is the type of respiration that involves the mitochondria for ATP production. That is oxidative phosphorylation. And therefore, the myocardium is going to require tons of oxygen, O2. So the O2 must be supplied in adequate amounts in a timely manner for the myocardium to function properly. And so there's a few things associated with the myocardium that help it meet this oxygen demand. The heart muscle as a whole has an extensive blood supply. And this, of course, is going to be through arteries called the coronary arteries. And I'm actually going to have a video uh, pretty soon where we're going to talk about those specifically. Those are the arteries that go over the surface of the heart itself and supply blood to mainly the myocardium. That's different than the blood moving through the chambers, just so you're aware. The myocardium, at least the cells, called cardiomyocytes, they contain lots of myoglobin, which is for storage of oxygen, and they contain a huge amount of mitochondria, and that's what allows it to produce all that ATP to continue beating all the time along with all that oxygen. And the interesting thing about the myocardium, that is the cardiomyocytes, uh, they're able to use a variety of fuel molecules, something that we're, we don't generally see in most cell types. So obviously the myocardium is going to be able to utilize glucose. Of course, glucose is going to run through glycolysis and be converted to pyruvate, which can then go through oxidation to acetyl-CoA. The myocardium can also utilize fatty acids through beta-oxidation, of course, which also produces acetyl-CoA. Also, lactate that's produced by the rest of the body. For example, during especially high-intensity exercise, skeletal muscles are generating a lot of lactate. It was once thought that lactate was a metabolic dead end. That has since been shown to be absolutely false. Again, I have a video on lactate. Go watch that. It'll be pretty interesting for you. But anyways, the lactate, after it's produced by skeletal muscles, it can move into the blood, and then the myocardium, of course, when it gets there, the lactate can be picked up by the myocardium and oxidized back to pyruvate, and then the pyruvate can then be converted to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is always our go-to. Also, non-essential amino acids, particularly the ketogenic amino acids, they can actually be oxidized by the myocardium to produce acetyl-CoA. And then, of course, during a fasting state or high-intensity exercise, ketone bodies can also be utilized and converted to acetyl-CoA. You're seeing a theme here? Acetyl-CoA. That's because acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle, and then you get a lot of NADH, FADH2, and, of course, that feeds into the mitochondria, where oxidative phosphorylation occurs. However, oxidative phosphorylation is nice. Being able to convert all these things to acetyl-CoA is nice as well, but there's one limiting substance, and that is oxygen. The myocardium needs oxygen. If you get one thing out of this video, make sure that's what it is. So the question I'm going to pose that we're going to answer on the next slide, what would happen if the myocardium was not receiving adequate oxygen? The short answer is a heart attack, but we of course want to understand why. Now, 
Really, there's two clinical disorders we're going to talk about where we have diminished oxygen delivery to the heart, uh, the myocardium specifically. One is angina pectoris, and the more severe one, obviously, is the myocardial infarction, which is a fancy term for a heart attack. But let's talk about what causes the limited oxygen delivery, which we actually term ischemia. We have two blood vessels right here. Okay? This bottom one is a healthy blood vessel, and we're going to assume this is a coronary artery. Okay? So if there's no occlusion in this blood vessel, we have an adequate amount of blood flow. I think that makes sense to everybody. However, let's introduce an occlusion to that blood vessel. Now this occlusion could be due to uh, multiple factors. Um, you could just simply have um, atherosclerosis in this blood vessel, which is called coronary artery disease, or you could have an embolus that was produced elsewhere in the body. It's a floating blood clot that moves through the vasculature and it just happens to end up in a coronary artery and block it. But whatever the mechanism is, if you have an occlusion, Notice that in the area where the occlusion is, the diameter of the blood vessel effectively is reduced. So there, the blood has to move around the occlusion, and therefore there's a limited amount of blood flow. Okay? So occlusions limit blood flow. And why is this diminished blood flow a problem? Well, what's in the blood? Yes, there's all these nutrients down here, but the big thing is oxygen. If you restrict blood flow to the myocardium by blocking a coronary artery, then you reduce oxygen delivery and it becomes ischemic. Now, if that ischemia, that limited oxygen delivery, if it's more transient and very minimal, and you just get chest pain, that's what we call angina pectoris. Okay, so angina pectoris is really just a fancy term that means chest pain. It's a localized pain and it usually occurs due to strenuous activity. So a classic example, you've got a middle-aged man working outside in the yard, whether it's raking and all sorts of stuff like that. He starts to feel chest pain. That is a key to stop whatever it is you are doing. Um, generally with angina pectoris, it's going to occur when you've got strenuous activity. Okay? Um, you do need to stop what you're doing and just sit down and rest. Um, now with angina pectoris, it really is just you're narrowing the coronary arteries and limiting oxygen delivery, but it's not as severe as it would be in a heart attack. And you know it's just angina pectoris when the pain subsides at rest. Generally, if somebody is prone to getting angina pectoris, they usually give somebody a treatment, a prescription for nitroglycerin or something like that that's a potent vasodilator. A vasodilator will keep these coronary arteries dilated as much as possible so that way you can increase the blood flow to the myocardium and therefore reduce the incidence or chance of angina pectoris. But the key with angina pectoris is the pain subsides at rest and it usually is transient. Now for a myocardial infarction, this is very bad. Myocardial infarction is literally death of tissue in the myocardium. The myocardium dies. It ends up being replaced with scar tissue that is non-contractile. And so anytime you have an infarction of that tissue, it dies and it does not regenerate. And so overall, over time, it's going to reduce the efficiency of the heart. And if the heart attack is serious enough, the person can die acutely from it. Okay. And so what a myocardial infarction is, is it's death of the cardiac muscle tissue. In angina, there's no death of tissue. Okay? It's simply just reduced blood flow and you end up with pain. And the pain is telling you, stop whatever it is you're doing. In a heart attack, the tissue actually dies. Okay? And depending on how widespread the occlusion is, how widespread the ischemia is, you can have more and more dead tissue. And so if blood flow is restricted to the myocardium to any significant extent, then that myocardium is going to be starved of oxygen and it will die. Okay? And when the tissue dies, that's called a heart attack. And so the two major differences, I suppose, between angina pectoris and a myocardial infarction is one, in angina pectoris, um, it subsides with rest. Okay? When you stop doing whatever it is you're doing, it subsides. Myocardial infarction, not necessarily. Okay. Um, also, with myocardial infarctions, you have death of the myocardium. Angina pectoris, the tissue does not die. Okay. It simply is becoming ischemic, and therefore the pain is just to tell you to stop doing what is, whatever it is that you're doing. If you're having a heart attack, you should, of course, also stop doing whatever it is you're doing. But myocardial infarction is a medical emergency. And so hopefully with this, I answered the question for you. 
what happens if we have the myocardium and it's not receiving adequate oxygen? Well, if it's not receiving adequate oxygen, if it's just a little bit, you'll get chest pain, angina pectoris, which is a signal stop doing whatever it is you're doing. But if it's severe enough of a blockage or an occlusion, there's such little oxygen delivery that the tissue dies, and that is a heart attack. And of course, the scientific term for that is a myocardial infarction. So hopefully this made sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.